and thank you for joining us for tonight's question and answer session for Lifetimes. Um, well, for all adoptive parents, including Lifetimes families that are joining us and families who are newer to the program and just beginning the adoption exploration process. We're glad you're with us. My name is Kim King. Co-hosting is Libby Murray, and we're here to answer the questions that are on your minds. Um, just to take care of a little housekeeping, um, if you have questions that pertain more specifically to your circumstances, feel free to call us. Um, the number is 1-800-923-6784. Um, we open Monday through Friday uh, for regular um, business hours, um, generally around 8 a.m. Pacific time. Time. And you are also welcome to send us an email through adopt at lifetimeadoption.com. If you've not already become part of the community on Facebook with us, our Facebook link is really easy to get to. That's facebook.com slash open dot adoption. Um, and I think that about covers it. Well, if you're already with Lifetime, then you should know you have your primary coordinator who is able to assist you with any of the next steps and questions. But if you don't have anyone and you wanted to ask for me specifically, that's totally fine with me. My name is Kim King, and my email is kim at lifetimeadoption.com. One thing to mention is if you are brand new to exploring adoption, our first step will be the free application online at lifetimeadoption.com. You can get directly uh, to the application by typing in lifetimeadoption.com slash apply. So with that, Libby, I hand the conversation over to you. <laughs> and I see we already have some questions. I can't hear Libby, but there it I appears am. you guys can hear me. Oh, there you are. Wow, we are batting a thousand tonight. <laughs> Thank you guys for bearing with us. <laughs> I thought maybe I hit my mute button. <laughs> uh, well, somebody hit my mute button, and it wasn't me, but I'm glad I'm back. It was probably um, me. That's it, Our wires are crossed. It thinks it's I, I'm you or something. Anyway. Uh, oh, oh, that might be true. Yeah. Well, so you all will just get... Um, a little entertainment tonight as we go around because <laughs> um, we we like to think we're had these webinars, but I guess it's always yeah. good to remember that there's always something to keep track of. Mm -hmm. So, um, can all of you hear me now? In the audience. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Yes, we Thank can hear you. you. Thank you for your participation. <laughs> um, so, what I was actually saying. Um, was just that, Kim, you and I have talked about how these adoption Q&As are often some of our favorite webinars because they're laid back and really it's about what the people who are showing up want to hear tonight. So um, it's fun for us because a lot of times we can guess what kind of questions you're going to ask, but the way that you ask them or or sometimes even when we know we've already been in contact with you and then you bring it up, helps us learn more about you, more about what other adoptive parents might need to know. And then what we love especially, too, is seeing the comments and the questions that come in addition to the initial prompted topic, um, the experience from all of you in the audience. So I really want to encourage you to type questions and share your comments tonight, um, and we will do everything that we can to try and answer as many as we can in this hour, but also try and type with you one-on-one -on -one, um, if we if we think that it's more appropriate to answer your questions behind the scenes. So I just mm -hmm. want to thank all of you for being here, and we do have a few questions to start us off tonight. So I wanted to I wanted to start with this question, Kim, because we don't often get asked home study questions in this way, and I'm assuming, um, thank you Valerie for submitting this, I'm assuming that this is related to an adoption home study and what to expect, and this is a great question because I'm also excited about a webinar we have coming in a few weeks where we will welcome a home study um, professional who's actually part of our um, Florida office here at Lifetime that will answer all of your questions about what to expect with home studies um, before, during, and after your adoption. So we want to address this tonight, but I'm also excited to have a webinar focused just on home studies because it is something that is 
vitally important to every adoption, and we get a lot of questions about it. But once you get the questions out and you get the answers, you usually realize, okay, this isn't as big of a deal as I thought it was going to be. So it'll be good to give you peace of mind, but also motivation to keep taking the appropriate steps. So mm -hmm. this question says, are there any unexpected home visits? And I'm just going to add to that. Any unexpected home visits with a home study provider? So Kim, in, in your experience with families um, before or after the adoption, how would you answer this question? Um, you know, for families who are coming through a program like Lifetimes where you're participating in a voluntary relinquishment, a private adoption, um, I don't believe that you would expect an unexpected visit. From my years here at Lifetime, what I've seen is that all of the visits are scheduled. They're like scheduled meetings where you are prepared well in advance. It's a time you all agree on. Um, I would say primarily they are in-home visits. Sometimes you will have meetings um, at the social worker's office. Um, but yeah, I would say that you can rest assured that there won't be any people knocking on your door unexpectedly to peep in on you when you are not um, planning on it. <laughs> I think that right. usually social workers want to set you up for success and have you be as prepared as possible and to be respectful of your time as well as theirs. I, I agree, Kim, and I would say so, where, that, where that question might be sparked, and, and mm -hmm. please chime in if, if there's more behind this question, um, but I have heard sometimes with maybe with foster care placements that there might be mm -hmm. surprise visits. But right, even right. then, um, and some of you who maybe, maybe have adopted through the foster system, you're welcome to chime in and let us know if you had any surprise visits when you were adopting. Um, but when it comes to private adoption, you know, usually the circumstances are a lot more stable and predictable. And so the social workers involved in completing your home study, I would say it's probably not a necessity to them to just show up unannounced because they also recognize you have a schedule. You know, if, if they show up and you're either leaving to go to work or um, out of town or or just away for the day, um, they're not going to expect you to stop your lives. So they're going to schedule ahead of time to do not only the initial visits, because most home studies will require that you have I've heard usually an average of two visits, but some states require three, some may require less or more than three, but usually you'll have two or three visits, I've heard, from the social worker to complete your home study before you adopt, just to get you ready. And they will schedule those with you um, at a time that works mutually uh, between you and them. And then mm -hmm. bring your baby home, you'll also have to plan on a a couple, I think one or two visits is normal. Some people may have gone through three. Um, so again, they know that you have a new baby, and they're not gonna mm. they're not gonna expect you to just be ready any time. So I think this could also be followed up with the question that we often get, which I know, if I were nervous about spontaneous visits, it would be because. <laughs> I like to pick up my house before company comes over or get the dishes out of the sink or just, you know, make sure that um, the last one to use the bathroom wipe the counters down or something like that. Um, so don't be paranoid about a white glove test, as Marty sometimes likes to, to say. You know, your home study mm -hmm. is not about um, if any of you have a very uptight or rigid mother-in-law who comes in and just kind of pokes around like, I can't believe you live <laughs> in this house this way, your home study provider is not going to be like that. They're, they're really more about you as a people. And yes, they're going to be looking at your living environment, but they're not coming in and, and thinking, how long has it been since you, know, you gave the dog a bath or turned their nails or since you disinfected the refrigerator? You know, they're not not eagle-eyeing your, your cleanliness unless it's just some obvious safety hazard. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're coming in to follow up. And after the adoption, they're also there as a support to you. So if there's questions that you have, like now that you have a relationship started with your child's birth mom, 
you might have more questions than you even knew to ask before you adopted when you were getting that home study done. So think of them as your advocate, because they're really there for you and to help you. Mm -hmm. So that was um, that's good. Let's see, did we get anyone chiming in on the, well, let's see. So we did have someone say with foster care they did have surprise visits. Um, I would be curious on that too, you know, what would happen when you weren't able to drop everything for a, a surprise visit. And those are things too that if you're thinking about any type of adoption is going to require a home study, you can ask them that. Hey, do you do surprise visits? What happens if I'm simply unable to accommodate your visit at the time that you show up? And, and just get a feel for that. Because um, mm -hmm. I would say also every state can be a little different too. So some of you might be thinking, no, that never happened to me. And then there might be others on the call thinking, that happened to me twice. So um, you can ask your home study provider too and say, what should we expect? And then how do we handle that when it happens if we need to rearrange or reschedule or juggle things? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Here's a question. Um, how long does it usually take for the process to complete before baby's birth and being able to ba take baby home? Um, well, most families have about six to eight weeks time frame to complete the home study. Um, in Lifetime's program, we actually will be able to start presenting profiles while the, pro while the home study is in progress. And um, for most families, there is some sort of a wait period. Our, average is like 6 to 18 months, but some families um, adopt sooner, some families take a little longer. And once you're matched in Lifetime's program, um, I would say birth moms are at least halfway through the pregnancy as early as maybe 16 weeks for some birth moms, but generally closer to halfway into the pregnancy. So that would be pretty much the longest you'd wait before the birth. And then um, once birth mom is going to give birth, then of course you're traveling to that state and you'll probably find a hotel nearby the hospital and um, then we will be walking you through everything so you'd keep us posted on when you arrive and everything uh, via our hotline. Um, and then we would have already um, orchestrated things with the social worker. You would have already retained legal services so the attorney is bringing into action with any paperwork that you're going to need. Um, to be able to have baby um, travel with you. Um, now, usually once the baby discharges from the hospital, uh, you have a period of wait time before the baby can travel across state lines, and that takes a week to two weeks. For most adoptions, you have baby in your arms that whole time once discharged from the hospital. In some, they may have something that's required uh, called cradle care to where it may be a few days before you receive baby into your arms after the birth um, or after the um, birth mom has consented to the adoption. So just different states may have some little, you know, specific procedures like that. Um, but most families in our program, um, the baby is discharged from the hospital directly with them. They go back to their hotel and then um, they're able to wait for clearance um, from the interstate compact. Um, so the attorney handles the interstate compact clearance, and then when they get the clear that they're able to travel across state lines, or if baby is able to travel across state lines, they can take baby out of that state, and then you also need clearance from your home state for baby to travel into your state. So both um, clearances usually um, are obtained within a day or two of each other. Thank you, Kim. Um, do you know, and the, the answer to that, the timeline questions, can really vary, of course, because every adoption yeah. is so unique. And we've had a lot of follow-up questions sort of to that effect, even from um, even, even from families who are currently waiting in Lifetime's program. And I know that's really one of, I would say it's probably the number one question is basically, how fast can I bring a child home? Yes. Um, and it's, it's a reasonable question. It's good to set healthy, rational, fair expectations, mm -hmm. um, but also that, you know, if you're in the process of researching an adoption professional, talk to them about what the average happens to be, you know, at the moment, but also 
talk to them about, okay, what happens if it happens faster or longer? Um, mm -hmm. So the thing is to be ready as soon as you can. And I know that for a lot of you who are already waiting to adopt, sometimes hearing that again and again and again probably starts to wear a little thin. But I cannot undervalue that suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, because I've worked with families where they were shocked because they came in and it was a matter of weeks before they were chosen by a birth mother. And then I've worked with other families where they were ready right away and then they waited a long time and then sometimes what happens are, you know, sometimes there's some of us that have an instinct or an inclination to just sort of slack off a little when things are taking longer and so then maybe someone lets their home study lapse. Um, mm -hmm. or they just think, you know, I'm just so tired of waiting. I want to disconnect, and they, mm -hmm. they just pull away, and they miss a phone call, or they don't respond to an email, um, and and then maybe, maybe they miss out, or maybe by then the birth mother's gone with a different family or something. So I know it can feel like, oh, I'm always on alert, but truly, I mean, it can happen anytime, and I... I always hear on adoption stories just how true it is that it just seems like, you know, whether it happens quickly or it takes longer, the right before it happens, there's sort of this moment of the adoptive parents thinking, oh, I'm just going to relax because it'll happen when it happens. And then they sort of like put their heels up and then they get a call and suddenly they're in, you know, fast forward and to to talk with a birth mom and start a match or maybe get on a plane and go meet a baby like we had this week uh, a family who's been waiting a little longer than average and um, they had actually just uh, updated their profile and then a few days later got a call about a, a baby out of state that was born and was going to be discharged from the hospital the next day and can you get here within 24 hours because the hospital wants to know who to release this baby to and mm -hmm. they got they got moving. They've got this little baby girl now. Um, but a great follow-up question to this, and I love this um, because it's, it's kind of a different twist on the question that we sometimes get. Oh, and I'm trying to find it now. Um, and thank you, Kevin, because I know that I know that there are families on the call that have been trying to wait patiently, and they attend nearly every webinar they can just so that they can touch babies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. learning as much as possible, and it's so wonderful to see that, and I want to say that every time that I see regulars on our webinars, I always think, I cannot wait till you adopt because I'm going to get you on the other side of this webinar to encourage other people. <laughs> yeah. And so just know that we recognize you and notice your name, and then Kim is one that works a lot with families who are in the early stages of adopting and getting to know Lifetime better, and it's so cool because she will often recognize you and mm -hmm. be able to get you more of the information that you're looking for. So I just want to, you know, kind of on a, we got a little side rail there, but just to praise you for being here tonight because it does help us get to know you more and see your name and know your needs. But this question was great. Um, it just says, what are some other reasons why a family may be waiting longer, you know, than the average six to 14 months to get chosen kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And and Kim, I mean, we've talked about this before. Sometimes, sometimes there are explanations. Um, mm -hmm. One huge one that I know for sure is if you put off completing your home study, or if your home study um, expires and you don't keep it updated. Sometimes you don't always hear that part of the family story when they're talking about how long it took them to take the child. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, it's good to question that, but the other side of that, too, is you don't always know the other side. Did they have hang-ups with that home study provider? Were there things out of their control that delayed things? Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, once in a blue moon, you'll have a family that's done everything that they're supposed to in, the time, in a timely manner, as we suggest. They are just super-duper overachievers doing everything that is, you know, their ideal. Every, it's picture perfect, it's yes. everything that they've already accomplished. And they haven't placed any limitations on their preferences. So really the only thing, the only explanation to me is 
the Lord's timing and that that birth mom that's right for them and that baby he has for them, you know, she's just not there yet. Um, mm -hmm. And we know that when families continue to follow the program that they have success. And so, you know, it's just a matter of sticking with it. And I know that's easier said than done. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, for the families that are having a little bit of a longer wait, um, this is why we have these webinars, and it's why we have the exclusive webinars just for our lifetime families, and why we have the Facebook community, and why we have the open door policy is because we want you to know that we are actively pursuing your adoption and to continue to give you tips on how to maintain your adoption readiness, even though it seems like, well, when is this ever going to happen? Most families adopt in less than two years. For the families who are waiting longer, I, I don't want to add insult to injury, but that is the reality. And by the time you really do adopt, whether you waited a short amount of time or whether you waited longer or somewhere in between, the timing of it is going to make total sense. And by the time you have that baby in your arms and know for sure this is your son or daughter, you won't have wanted to have it any other way. That's true, and I know that's true because we hear that. We hear that time and time again from families mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. whether they adopt within six months or two years, that they're holding their child and they couldn't imagine it going differently. But when you're on the front mm -hmm. end heading towards that child, I know, you know, I've encouraged a couple families this week, just I know that it's hard. We all know it's hard. There are actually um, some people on staff at Lifetime, some of your Lifetime team has either gone through infertility or adopted or known people who have or maybe um, had their own experiences with miscarriage or um, hardship with their with their children or, or parenthood seasons and so there's so much compassion that circles around because of the comfort and the knowledge and experience we've gained through a lot of our own experiences outside of our work it's always amazing to see how God has brought us together as a team that seems to be able to identify with this. And so I know that one of the most difficult things for families, whether you are already waiting or you're about to begin adoption, is people often talk about, oh, the wait. The wait is the hardest. And I would say not to dread it, but prepare yourself. If you know your weaknesses, you know, surround yourself with the people that help keep you accountable to positive thinking and in reality too because it's easy to spin off even if I, I've dealt with families Kim that have only been waiting a few weeks and they sometimes make the same comments as families who have been waiting say 18 months mm -hmm. so I know that no matter how long you've been waiting you've already had a long journey before you got to us mm -hmm. and that when you want to add a child to your life it couldn't be soon enough because mm -hmm. You know, there's, I mean, all of you can probably identify. I mean, we know people in our lives that just seems like they add children to their family without even thinking. And then mm -hmm. here, there are a collection of families, all of you joining us tonight, who are thinking about it so much that you're actually attending webinars, reading books, asking questions, joining community groups, getting support, you know, that it's right there. And you are, you are preparing so much. And we recognize that. And I wish, I wish there was more that we could say that, that words would make sense. But like Kim said, it's, that, it's the hindsight. And I just want to say, as someone who's gone through, Kim and you and I, would, we could both mm -hmm. say this, someone who's gone through loss and gone through grief, that finding forgiveness and healing and moving forward and reaching something that is beautiful and blessing mm -hmm. doesn't always take away your memories of the loss or the disappointments or the difficulties that happen. They don't always, it doesn't always replace it or make up for it, but you, you just see, I just, I, you finally get to a place of peace where you realize I wouldn't have this child if I hadn't gone through that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a, pers a perspective comes over you, you can look forward to. I've never ever, even our most, I would say, I hate to say this, but even the families who have just had the most difficult time with the weight and even sometimes been maybe a little harsh or rude or um, 
difficult to encourage or, or get information from. Um, once they adopt, they, I've never even heard those families complain about it. Mm -hmm. So just know that there will be perspective on the other side. But going back to the initial question, what are some of those reasons? Like Kim said, sometimes it can't be explained because it really is about a birth mother's choice. And I know, um, I know that it is easy. It is easy for our insecurities to play into that and think, what if, what if there's something about me? What if it's me that I can't control who I am necessarily and how a birth mom sees me? Um, if I'm just being honest about who I am and putting my best impression forward, mm -hmm. just remind yourself. There, you, you know, most of you on the call tonight are married, you or you know married people. Just remind yourself it's very similar, like it has to be the right birth mom and that she's going to notice you for who you are and love you for who you are and what you can offer her child. And it's easy to focus on the rejection, but what you should focus on is it only takes that one birth mom to see in you the solution for her baby. Mm -hmm. And and then she will move forward. And. Um, I mean, I mean, really, what would you do with a handful of women who were all coming at you at the same time? How could you possibly choose and tell one woman, yes, I want to adopt your baby, and the others, no, I don't want to? I mean, it's an impossible choice. Um, so the fact that she gets to choose you is going to benefit your whole story in the long run. Um, you know, other things sometimes why families have waited is if they delayed in completing their adoption profile or getting online. Um, you know, if, if there's no way for a birth mom to learn about you, certainly it's going to take longer to be found. Um, you know, sometimes we've worked with families that have um, gone through failed adoptions. And that can... I mean, certainly that can add a setback because you go through a match, you're moving forward, and then it might feel like you're starting over. Um, but the way we always see it is um, not to belittle it or discredit it, but your your path is continuing. There's not really a backtrack happening. You're not rewinding and starting over. You're, okay, that didn't pan out. That didn't go to success. So you keep moving forward. And that's one of the unique things about Lifetime is that we – want to see you succeed. So if you go through a failed adoption or a fall, a fall through with a match, um, we're going to put you back in and keep looking for the next match. So and that's another thing when you're researching adoption professionals is to ask them, what happens if the adoption falls through? What if it doesn't happen? Because some programs I've heard, they're just all about getting you to one opportunity. And if whether or not it succeeds or fails, that that was all their their services entailed. Yeah, they completed their obligation, and you either have right. to make arrangements to start over or go with someone else. Right. And so then there's other programs like Lifetimes where it's more about um, seeing your success and that our services are not just about one match. We're about getting you out to as many birth mothers as possible so that you can be found by the right one. And if, you're, if your adoption falls through, we add that time back and continue looking for another match for you. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, again, these, these all, all these answers can kind of vary. Um, because everyone's Can I, are a little different. I wanted to pipe in. I don't think you had mentioned this one. Correct me if I'm wrong. But... Sometimes families start out with certain preferences, and then after coming into the program and after we're all in agreement that, yeah, we're the best fit for you, and we see adoptions that you're looking for all the time, and you have characteristics birth moms are asking for, and with these preferences, you know, we have a confidence. And so we all agree that we're going to be a team, and then the family moves forward into the program, and then their preferences change, that they narrow down drastically. You know, there's a family that... Um, long, long time ago, they had decided that now that they're in the program, they only want twins or siblings. But right. like 95 to 97 percent of our adoptions are a single infant. If they would have told us that in advance, then we would have known that we are not the best fit to be a team together. Turns out they just 
had a misperception as to how preferences worked, and then they got back on the page, and you know things went smoothly from there. Um, but that's the type of thing that can definitely throw a hitch in things that you know, your adoption professional isn't really able to make an informed decision and give you the best advice unless they know the facts of what you're looking for in your adoption. Exactly. Which is, for those of you maybe who are just beginning um, to learn about adoption, um, your preferences, some people call it search criteria, um, other mm -hmm. other professionals may have different vocabulary, but at life Such as the race of child, or age of child, health of right. the child things like that. The, the things that define the opportunities and situations that you would say yes to. Yes, this mm -hmm. is what we're looking for. Um, yes. It's so important that you're honest about it. And Kim, I've been thinking a lot um, recently. I was I was planning um, I was planning a party for a friend and I was trying to look for some venues. Um, and we we're on very limited budget. And I was thinking about our adoptive families as I was researching because I know, for instance, um, preferences and budget sometimes are things that people get real shy about being honest with us about or talking mm -hmm. about openly. Mm -hmm. But they are the they are key elements that allow us to better answer your questions and point you in the direction where you can succeed. Mm -hmm. So um, my search for this venue, like. I, I kind of clammed up because I was thinking, like, oh, I don't, you know, I just want to know how much you are, so then I can tell you yes or no, rather than knowing what I what I ended up realizing was, okay, no, I need to know the whole package that's happening here, not just a figure or whether it's outside or inside or um, has a kitchen or doesn't have a kitchen, you know, things like that. Yes, there's elements that were specific I was searching for, but at the same time. What I was thinking about was how often our adoptive parents will hold information back because they think they're not going to understand. I've got to figure this out for myself and then tell them. Rather than calling, talking with us, being open, saying, you know, well, my husband's real shy. Like, I'm open to adopting a child of a different race, but he's not there yet. And, and then we can talk with you about what other families have done, information that might help. Um, that way you can get on the same page rather than delaying a start or delaying opening up to criteria that you would say yes to. We can get you answers that will help you. Um, same thing, you know, if you're thinking about expanding your adoption budget or you're just starting out and you're thinking, what do I expect and how do I, um, how do we get started? Just be honest with us and say, look, you know, this is this is all we've saved right now. Are we going to need to plan for more, or how do we do it within this, or um, what do other families do to fundraise, all of it. It's OK to talk to us about that stuff. There's no judging happening here. Um, you know, I've had many conversations with families who have often been contemplating opening up to age or different race of child when they're doing their search. Um, and sometimes they get real shy about, and Kim, I know you've had these conversations too. Um, they get really shy about just telling us what's on their mind. But what, when it finally comes out, we're better able to help. Um, so when it comes to your preferences, if you have questions, just ask. It's OK. Nobody's here thinking, what, you only want a three-year-old? Why? You know, no, we're going to say, can you tell us more about that? And sometimes it comes from maybe a just a misunderstanding, thinking I can't adopt a newborn. Or maybe it comes from, well, um, my my aunt has a ton of you know clothes for a three-year-old girl, and I just thought that would be easy to step in. And we can just kind of like hash it out. Anytime you shed light on questions, it just gives you more information so that you can be pointed in the direction that's going to help you the best. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Kim? Yeah. I think it does, because what I was thinking when you were talking was it allows us to jump in there with you and figure out a solution with you, rather than you having to try and figure out what questions to even ask, you know? Exactly. So have, that's what happens. Having a relationship found, and a connection. Exactly. I found a, a really great little little venue, going back to the example, and but initially when I was looking at their packages and their time slots and things like that, I was thinking, this isn't going to work for me. But when I finally got real with the coordinator and was asking her, 
you know, telling her more about my situation and, and the goal for the event. Then she said, well, here's an option. And she started kind of like pointing at different um, packages that they offered and different options that I hadn't even thought of. Like I didn't even think, you know, are they flexible or is it rigid? And she was just talking about, well, here's what other people have done. And that is the most freeing statement to hear, you know, knowing that you are not alone in your question or in your thought or in your research or concern, but to hear somebody who's heard it before say what other people have done that has worked and helped and been a solution within that parameter. So, so yeah, take advantage of, of us. You know, if you're already working with a coordinator, make sure that, make sure you feel comfortable telling her what you're thinking about, and then confirm when you make decisions so that we know the best way to help you move forward. Mm -hmm. um, there was um, a question. I think it's sort of almost like an open adoption question, sort of. Um, but it says, a fear is that we'll adopt, and then many, many years later, she's like 15, 18, 21 years later, our <laughs> child will want to leave us for the birth mom. Naturally, there are no guarantees in life, but sometimes facts help quell fears. So, yes. you know, how often does that really happen? I really like this question. I, I, I think do we'll too, be able to help you feel better about it. I think um, I think it's important to remember that these these birth mothers aren't aren't looking to trick their child or trick you, um, mm -hmm. and that. I just want to say, as someone who was raised by her biological parents and kept her nose clean and everything, like, I still wanted to live with other people through high school. Like, you know, there were maybe friends I had that seemed like their parents had a little later curfew or bought them a car when I still had to borrow my dad's 83 Honda or whatever, you know, like, there's always a greener grass. Um, and certainly through adolescence, it's easy to notice that more. Um, but the reality was there was no way my parents, because everything was relatively stable, um, there's no way my parents were going to say, oh, well, sure, we'll arrange for you to go live with your best friend. Mm -hmm. um, they were my parents. They, they towed the line. They set the expectations. And so sometimes people worry when, um, when there's an open adoption and you have maybe a lot of contact and your child knows um, his or her birth mom, maybe even has, you've all had visits together throughout his life, um, that that birth mother, the relationship you form, you'll probably be surprised because let's say worst case scenario in your head happens and your son comes to you at 16 and says, I'm going to go live with birth mother Sheila. Your first response is not just going to be to break down in tears and fear. You're going to be the parent. You're going to say, where's this coming from, and why do you think you get to just live with whoever you think you can? You know, mm -hmm. and talk to them about where they're coming from, what is their goal, what's their objective, uh, what is this plan they've cooked up. And then most likely, you probably would have already heard, if, if that it was happening, chances are good that his birth mother may have even called you and said, hey, he just sent me this message on Facebook, and I don't know where he's coming from on this, but, like, I don't want him thinking that, you know, he can just toggle around wherever is comfortable and fun. Um, and so, in a sense, many open adoptions these days, the birth mother sees you as the authority. I would say most, most open adoptions, unless there is, Inter interfamily adoptions sometimes get a little squidgy, um, but in a private adoption like we see, these birth mothers would probably be shocked um, if their child at adolescence or older wanted to come stay with them. Now, if your child is a grown adult, let's say they're in college and they thought, you know, I have an opportunity and a little bit of money, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to travel out to Iowa and spend two weeks getting to know her better. You know, if, if your son's 22, you, you probably by that time might, might actually be in a place of encouraging that because he's just embracing a part of him. Um, but it doesn't threaten you as the parent. And in those cases, when I've heard that happening, it's, 
it's actually been something the adoptive parents have usually told me that it happened and then said, we're actually excited for him to spend this time with her because they never really got to talk before. And I know he has a lot of questions about his birth family history. And um, she's going to show him around his, the town he was born in and stuff. But it's hard to predict that. And I hope that saying these things, Kim, I hope that this isn't overwhelming some of these people because it's easy to think about babies and how easy it is to, you know, bring a baby home or a toddler home. And But eventually they grow up and they're going to have questions about their adoption. And open adoption allows all of you to have a conversation about it that doesn't have to be like the old days, which feels sticky and uncomfortable and secret. You're, you're probably not going to be surprised if your child wants to spend some one-on-one -on -one time as an adult with his or her birth mom. On the flip side, um, I always love referring to some of the families also that have grown children who have said, I like knowing that she's out there. I love that you guys have kept in touch and that the availability is there, but I don't need that. I don't need a stronger personal connection with her. So not all, not all children have the same needs. Just like when you raise a child biologically, if you have, you know, brothers and sisters in the home, some of them are going to want to know mom and dad in, in one way, and the others might not keep a close relationship. So sometimes it's a little hard to predict, but it's not usually something that we see threatening the family or the home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. and. You know, in adolescence, there are times that come up for most parents to where there's a little bit of rebellion in the child. And um, some people just have that adoption card to be able to play, and others play the aunt card or whatever. <laughs> and, um, right. But, you know, yeah, the, grandma card. the other thing I think that sometimes parents fear is that there's this some sort of mystical existing bond between that child and birth mom that is going to be so much stronger than the bond you could ever create with them even though you're there 24 7 as mom and dad that's just mm -hmm. not reality you know um, the birth mom while she is out there and wanting to make sure you have access to the best information for your child and wants to know that you know the child was placed because she loved them so much not because she didn't care about them or they weren't wanted or anything like that. She's not going to have an active parenting role um, or any type of parenting role other than just being out there and supportive in your parenting. So you guys are basically the stars of the show um, in your child's life. And there's not really a way that a birth mom's going to have that kind of bond to where the child suddenly becomes of age to where they can voice their opinions and finally reveals they'd rather live with their birth mom. We. As far as statistics on that happening, I don't think we really see that, especially in our program. Maybe with foster adoption, that might be a little more of a special well, I think case. Um, when you talk openly with your child about their adoption story, and you know, I'm not a counselor, and so mostly most of my knowledge is going off of other information I've read, but primarily also just over our years of lifetime and getting the updates mm -hmm. and hearing also from birth moms um, mm -hmm. who have an open adoption going on actively, it's much less complicated than the situations that we're describing. Yeah. Um, and it becomes, like any other relationship that moves along, something that you communicate about. So, you know, it, it's normal for a child to question their identity and question where they came from, whether that was a biological family and maybe there's deep, dark secrets with, you know, grandpa and whether or not he ran out on the family. Or if there's alcoholism, mm -hmm. a lot of families struggle these days to be honest about that with the next generation. Um, eating issues, uh, maybe criminal history in a previous generation. Like, there's always something that maybe people hint around about like I had an aunt that passed away when she was in her 20s, and nobody in my family, I, didn't, I never knew her. Nobody in my family will ever tell me, uh, like, her story. And I think it's just we're in a different time now where people are opening up about things, and that is the beauty of open adoption is that it's probably more natural for a child to have, like, a, 
a huge swing of interest um, and to really hold on to this concept of I must have some strong bonding tie with this mother out there somewhere because nobody will talk to me about her. Like there's this fantasy that's happening. But when you can actually talk to your child honestly, say, yeah, we know her. We met her. We actually hear from her time to time or send her updates. You know, that throughout the child's life you're just you're just being honest as age appropriate. Um, and making making basically an atmosphere where your child knows they can talk to you about their questions and that you're going to be open to it and not be scared. Um, I, I think that probably happens less and less in these newer generations, Kim, where where there is this whole I, I'm going to go off on a you know two year search to look for her. Instead, it's a, I don't have a fantasy about her. I even know her address and, and how to email her. Yeah, there's no searching involved because we've been keeping right. in touch all along, you know. Right. And, and even um, one of the you have an adoption. I just wanted to add because I know we have families on the call who have adoptions that started out as open, and maybe now the birth mother has drifted away, and you have mm -hmm. a school age child. You might sometimes those families actually write to us and say, "What do I do? Because I haven't heard from her in so long, and I just I always wanted to be able to have those answers or that." those questions and I thought we were but she's kind of drifted off I always mm -hmm. say you know it's okay to it's okay to tell your child the truth and just say we love her we don't know what's going on in her life right now or that makes her unable to be in touch but we're available to her when she's ready and you start teaching that child just about how people are different and they go through things and you can't always understand someone's story until they tell you exactly what's going on and to just let them know we care about her because She's precious to how our family came together, and and just whatever's in your heart, you'll you'll know you because every adoption is so different. Um, you might even know. Well, you know, actually, we heard we heard that she got into some trouble, and she's, um, you know, she doesn't have a phone right now or something. You know, yeah. If you have the information, and if you don't, then you just say, son, I. I think about her too. I keep wondering how she's doing, and I hope I hope she gets back in touch with us. You know that you can just leave it there. You don't always have to have a definitive answer for everything your child asks. Yes, and um, with open adoption, part of it is the parenting decision to have always shared about adoption from birth, which is kind of it's kind of hard to imagine having a conversation about adoption with a newborn, but basically you don't. You just it's just a fact that's always known. It's not avoided. It's not kept secret. When the topic of how the baby came to your family comes up, then the, the natural answers are part of the conversation. Um, so that's part of, I think, feeling comfortable about open adoption is just knowing your child's going to grow up always having known and that there's never going to come a day to where you're revealing this big secret about that they were through adoption instead of biologically, you know. So if they've just always known it, then they don't really question too much about it. You've always just been open about it. There's no mystery. Um, and here's a question that says, how do you avoid an open adoption becoming co-parenting? And I think from the start, it's good to have healthy um, parameters um, because open adoption has benefits for everybody if it's handled in an appropriate manner. So um, usually it starts out with having um, some sort of contact during the adoption planning. Um, so to where you'd have phone calls, maybe you text each other every now and then to see how she's feeling, if she has questions for you, um, just logistic conversations about planning for your travel and the impending birth, um, you know, words of comfort as to, you know, how much you appreciate her and how highly you think of her and things like that. Um, and then you go through this, um, you know, time in your life which is just, you know, one of the most important times of your life where you receive your child into your arms and she's the person who really is the determining factor in that happening specifically for you, specifically with this child. And after that, usually um, you'll, of course, maintain some form of contact, but you want to give her her space and kind of see how she feels. And she may kind of just um, Draw, draw back a little bit in her grieving period because it might be a little too much for her. Or she might say, you know, what would really help me is if you could just send me a picture of whatever she's doing right now. 
you know. And so there are little things that you can just kind of be sensitive to with the birth mom at that point. Um, and for that, formally, uh, I think most adoptions include sending letters and photos twice a year. Might be quarterly um, for the first couple of years, and then go to twice a year. So that would be an agreement that was already arranged, you know, when you match. Um, and then visits, I think, are. For families who are new to adoption planning and um, maybe new to lifetime, visits can sometimes be a huge question mark, like, well, how does that work? And how often is that? What does it involve? Um, visits could be as simple as meeting for lunch in a public place. It's maybe once or twice a year at the most. And it's only as long as everything's healthy. So it's not like some extended weekend. Um, unless you naturally have that relationship, then great. That's wonderful for you guys, you know. But not everyone has that. And so making a plan to meet in a public place um, to have lunch or participate in a family activity together, it's as simple as that. That could be the visit. So it's not visitation. It's not going to become co-parenting because she doesn't have any parental rights. Um, and the contact is really actually pretty limited in relation to your full-time 24-7 role as mom and dad. I wanted to, um, oh, I just lost it. Where did it go? There was something you were talking about, Kim, and there was a question that came in. Just going back, I wanted to clarify, because there was a great question that says, how do you avoid an open adoption from becoming co-parenting? Right. And I just want to share clearly, these, these birth mothers who are moving forward with matches, they're not, they're not looking for a joint custody shared shared parenting opportunity. Usually the women who call and they're looking for more like help, um, somebody to help them, maybe take the baby off their hands while they're at work or um, during the week. Until or they finish the school. Finish. Yeah. Right. Those are not adoption candidates. So sometimes what happens though, they might call with those expectations and when we educate them about what open adoption is, they might decide well, actually, yeah, that sounds better because I, I would like my, my child in a stable, permanent situation with parents that are always there and constant. Um, mm -hmm. Other times she might say, that's not what I want because I really want to be my baby's mama. And so then we might point her to some local resources and say, you know, you need to explore this and make a plan so when your baby's here, you know, you're ready and you know how you're going to handle daycare or money or rent food, diapers, you know, all of it. Um, but the women who move forward with adoptions in our program, they're looking for adoptive parents who are going to be mom and dad. So she's usually in a place where she highly respects your position as mom, mommy, and daddy, not just mother, father, parent. Um, and so then another question here was, um, you know, I think it's important to make sure a child understands the difference in the roles between birth mother, adoptive mother, um, adoptive parent, adopt, you know, birth parent. And that is true, and that's the benefit, that's one of the benefits of having open adoption and being honest with your child from the beginning, is that just like, just like grandma or grandpa or aunt and uncle or cousins or brothers and sisters, you know, that, like I grew up with, um, my mother had a best friend and a child uh, her best friend had a child about my age. Well, her child always called my mom um, aunt. And I remember being a little, little, little kid and saying, Mom, is is she my aunt? And my mom said, well, no, you know, we're not, but, you know, technically that's not aunt. And just explained the difference, but just that was just a nickname that that child had for my mom. I didn't mm -hmm. refer to her parents as aunt and uncle. Um, so it was about just being honest and clear when the child had questions, and, and those questions may come up, like, well, tell me again, we, we, oh, I came out of Shelly's tummy, yeah, you know, and usually, I've heard from other adoptive parents, and you can go to adoptionteleconference.com, you'll probably hear this on a handful of the webinars when they talk about their, you know, how they talk about adoption with their children, but, um, a lot of adoptive parents say, you know, it's really not that big of a deal to my child. They asked questions, I answered it, and then they picked up their baseball and went outside. Like, mm -hmm. they're not sitting there spinning around and around, but wait a minute, what does that mean? You know, they know 
what it does is it sets a tone. They know they can come back to you and you're not afraid to answer them. And honestly, I think that sets the tone for every other major issue in parenting. You know, they're going to have questions about um, how to pick the right friends or, you know, homework ethics or sportsmanship. You know, all these important things that are building character in their lives that you're going to set a tone as a parent that I'm here to answer questions and I may not always know the answers, but I don't, I'm not going to get mad if you ask me and I'll do everything I can to get you the answers and information you're looking for, son. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so don't be afraid of what's coming. There's a lot of books too, a lot of children's books also that make the adoption conversation easier as that child grows up, that you can just read stories about adoptions and it paints this picture out and then you can see, well, that's, that's like you, you know, that's how you came to us. So mm -hmm. don't feel like you have to know everything tonight because every child is yeah. different, every birth mother is different, and, and your story is going to be unique. And once your story happens, it will probably be easier for you to imagine how you're going to include that story um, as part of your child's upbringing. And just some practical advice as well. Um, and Libby, you'll probably laugh because I'm always harping on this, but positive adoption <laughs> language, right? So, yes. you know learning positive adoption language for yourself and making positive adoption language a habit, such as we call birth moms birth mom or by her actual name, but we don't call her your real mommy. That's not, no, that would be very confusing, right? So we just call her by the term birth mom or by her name, maybe throw a miss in front of it and call it a day. <laughs> but something as simple as that can really help the child have a better understanding of what adoption is and isn't and not have fears that their real so-and-so is going to come get them, you know, and that yeah, you're the temporary mommy. caregivers because you're not. Right. And yeah. ask, you can talk about that with your child's birth mom. Um, a lot of mm. times they'll actually ask us, well, I, you know, I don't. I don't want. I don't want my child to call me, to call me by my first name. You know, I'd like them maybe. To, maybe she'll come up with some cute nickname like Ra Ra or something like that. You know, that mm -hmm. um, that just refers to her in an endearing way, but as a different role. Um, mm -hmm. And your child might come up with their own name, or um, the, you'll find the right answer for your family. Yes. Absolutely, and those that part of it, what to how to refer to the birth mom is very unique, and sometimes, like you said, Libby, it just comes out when the child is learning to talk. <laughs> you know, when they're say, or when they're pronouncing the birth mom's name, it's it'll just kind of morph into a nickname that you have for the birth mom that's more of a, an endearing term. So, um, but positive adoption language, and also just having the confidence for you as parents. You are mom and dad. The adoption will have taken place in the past. And so that, you know, another, I'm sorry to harp on this, but positive adoption language. You are not having your, your child of your own and then your child through adoption. All children of yours are yours, whether biologically or through adoption. So, but I can understand how it could be really alienated, alienating if when they hear their parents talk about their story of their adoption, that they say, well, we had tried to have kids of our own. Right. But then it didn't work out, so we adopted. You know, that's, right. well, we Instead tried to have saying, biological we tried to, children. We tried to get yeah. pregnant, mm -hmm. um, and it yeah. didn't happen, and so we were blessed to adopt, you know. The yes. Teaching, and, and I know most of you on the call are probably shaking your heads because maybe now that you've decided to adopt, you still have relatives in your lives that are saying, <laughs> what, you're not going to keep trying to have one of your own? And... Uh, it's an education opportunity to say, I know what you're trying to say. We are done trying to get pregnant. Uh, that's a good way of putting it, Libby. I love that. We are going to adopt a child of our own. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's okay. Don't be rude. Don't be harsh. You don't have to smack <laughs> in the face with a list of proper language. Just use it. <laughs> Eat it back in a way that also when you say things like that, it reassures your soul and your heart and your mind that mm -hmm. this child is going to be yours. 
So any insecurity that you have between, will I love a child that I adopt as much as if I gave birth? Or will people see that child as mine? Or will they always be talking about, well, yeah, but you adopted? No. All of those are insecurities that rarely, if ever, pan out these days. And a lot of it comes down to the words that you say to yourself as well. So if in your head you're the one that keeps saying, are we ready to stop trying to have a child of our own? Maybe you need to readdress that internally too. Um, mm -hmm. because, because then that is also going to help you focus on what's right for your family. So if you're on the call tonight and you're thinking, yeah, I'm not done trying to get pregnant. Like, I really want to, I really want to try that. That's okay. It is okay. So put yourself in a frame of mind to know that every step you're taking is leading to a child of your own. Mm -hmm. Whether it's biological or through adoption, you are getting you're getting to that. And every family's on a different course and a different pace. And yes. Kim, I know we were going to try and end on time tonight, but this kind of leads me to something I actually was thinking about last night that I was hoping to share tonight, and I'll try and be fast mm -hmm. here. But um, whenever I walk my dog, I always have these little moments of <laughs> Hey, I'm, I, I have a name for those. Tiffany you do. Tiffany's. Yes, because <laughs> my dog's <laughs> Our dog's name is Tiffany, so. <laughs> um, yes, and, but it's just so true because, you know, if, especially as we walk in faith um, and we think about following God towards our child and we think about trusting him with our future, um, often when I'm on a walk, my dog is a leash dog um, because if I let her off the leash, she will run and not remember how she got there. So um, we're walking, and there was another dog, Black Lab, that was very free-spirited and off-leash and just having a wild time with a Frisbee <laughs> and his owner. And my dog kept, um, she was still keeping pace with me, um, but she kept looking over her shoulder and, like, pulling at the leash and trying to kind of, like, but I want to see that. I want to watch that. I want, like, that dog's having fun. I mean, I know she's an animal, but this is how it panned out in my head. And and I'm going, come with me. Focus. What you get, like, focus. Look where you're going. Because she also kept bumping into me every time she tried to walk perpendicular to the path. So I'm walking, and I felt like, I felt a whisper in my head that said, don't you think you do that? And it's so true because, you know, how often do we hear about other people getting pregnant or adopting and we think we just like, we are perpendicular to the path because we are just looking at them. We are looking at them mm -hmm. doing their thing. And meanwhile, well, the words that came to me, because I was thinking about my dog, I'm like, all day you've wanted to go on this walk. We are, we are doing what you want to do. Like, you're getting what you want. But here she's watching somebody, some other dog's story and not paying attention to her own. And she's, she's oh. <laughs> getting, chomped at, getting chomped at on the leash and, you know, like tripping over things. And I thought, that's, that is so us. How often are we watching other yeah. people's stories and we're not paying attention to our past? And mm -hmm. and it just, to me, I just thought, I need to remember to tell that to families because it's so easy for us to look at other people, especially when, you know, you've been trying to get pregnant or you've been trying to adopt and you hear about other people adding children to their lives and you just keep thinking, when is it my turn? Like, they, you know, they've adopted twice and I'm still waiting for my first child or they, they're on their fourth child and they've never even tried. Every pregnancy they had was just unintended. Um, and, and we tried for four years and even put money into it, and we never even got one positive pregnancy test. It's so easy to walk perpendicular to your path because you are watching somebody else's story. But the thing that's comforted me the most recently is, is just the phrase, it's not my story. That's not my story. That's their story. So if any of you are on the call tonight and you're just you're in that zone because you're thinking like, yeah, well, I'm still I'm still researching adoption, but I've just been so discouraged lately because I feel like babies are popping left and right. Either they're being born or they're being announced in pregnancy, and I'm tired of looking at Facebook or at adoption websites because it's not happening to me. And if that's you, it's okay to take a break from those announcements, but get back on your path. Look at your mm -hmm. own path. Because the story that you're panning out right now is something that other people are also going to watch too. 
and then you're going to be able to encourage them, okay, yeah, like, but I stayed on my path, so you stay on your path, and you'll get where I'm going, too, because the path you're taking tonight is getting you where you want to go. Mm -hmm. So just when you, when you watch other people's paths and stories and them playing around and doing other things differently than you are, you just have to remind yourself, that's not my life, that's not my story, that's their story. So even though it might sting a little or hurt or just remind you of your longing, just keep reminding yourself that that's their story. Like, my story's still in progress, too. Just because I'm watching somebody else get what I want to be celebrating doesn't mean it's not going to happen for me. It just means mm -hmm. it hasn't happened for me yet. So just tell well, yourself, that's not my story. While you're talking, I'm looking at our little graphic that you created here for this webinar, and it has this fan a mom and a dad and a little tiny little guy. I'm assuming a boy in the blue outfit. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, look at this family. Do you think they would have had it any differently? You know, it's it's perfect. You can tell. They're so joyful. It's perfect. And they stuck to their path, like Libby's saying, and I just think that's such a good analogy. And watching or staring at this gorgeous family, you know, while you're talking, it's just, I'm feeling like it's really encouraging, and I'm hoping that those who are hanging in there to the end of the webinar are finding that this is encouraging as well. And just know that we're with you, and we're here to help you and to be a support and an encouragement to you. So attending these webinars, it's totally worth it. It's going to pay off when you get to that day, and your mind, spirit, physically ready for that adoption to take place. Um, you know, I just think it's a great thing that you're here with us tonight, and we really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I just I want to thank all of you who had questions. I'm going to hang around a little bit and try and uh, answer some questions um, if I can or point you to the coordinator that I think might be able to better answer your question maybe tomorrow or, or next week. But just please remember that we are available for questions one-on-one -on -one too. So if you have a coordinator at Lifetime, remember she's available to you. Don't feel like it's a, you know, we'll call you situation. You know, if you have a question, especially if it affects your adoption readiness or your, um, what we're searching for you, reach out to your coordinator and connect. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're on the front end and you're just starting a research lifetime or maybe you're getting ready to start the program, um, contact the coordinator who's been helping you or just reach out to our office because we can get you to the right person. So you can always call our office, 1-800-923-6784. You can always email adopt at lifetimeadoption.com, or, um, or Kim generously offered herself up to to get you the right place. <laughs> you can always write to Kim, uh, Kim at lifetimeadoption.com. And um, if you're wondering tonight about the first step um, to working with Lifetime is to apply because it helps us learn more about you and what you're looking for but also if we feel that we will be able to help you succeed. And you can apply free um, at lifetimeadoption.com slash apply. And then for those of you on the call who are currently working with Lifetime, um, you have a webinar coming up next week on Monday. And then for those of you who aren't yet working with Lifetime but also for Lifetime families, we have I'm very excited about uh, a webinar coming up on the 12th where we're going to welcome two of our most popular webinar guests. Rebecca uh, and Meredith, they're each adopted moms that we've heard on webinars and many of you told that those were two of your favorite stories. And so I asked these women back, they're, gonna, they're just going to field questions from audience. So if it helps you to get a doctor or school doctor briefly, please find us a channel here in the station. I don't know what stage of adoption you're in. So look for information about your email and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to sign off because the computer's doing weird things again, Kim, and I think that it's probably <laughs> time to wrap up anyway. So. Yeah, uh, well, thank you all. I hope.